I wear glasses so I can see clearly. Here's a picture of my storage room in which I keep my reference books I use for these Bible studies, as well as paintings I can't sell, and all my video and photographic equipment. I can't use them unless I have a lens through which I can see them. We need a lens when we read the Bible as well in order to understand it clearly. It can be blurry, confusing, and even dangerous. Scripture can be dangerous. So it is not only helpful to have a lens to help understand the scriptures, it's absolutely critical. In Mark 12, 28 to 34, Jesus gives us a lens through which we can view the rest of the Bible in order to understand it correctly. As a devout Jew, Jesus recited this lens every morning and every evening. It's called the Shema. In chapters 11 and 12, Mark has selected various occasions in which Jesus is confronted by experts in the law in the temple in Jerusalem. The scene starts with Jesus throwing all those merchants out of a market that wasn't supposed to be in the temple, but that the Sanhedrin had allowed to be in there because they made a good income off of it. And of course, that angered the Sanhedrin, right? It was their income, like they say, to follow the money, right? So they sent a continual series of experts in the law to try to get Jesus to say something incendiary that would cause the crowd to turn against him because the crowd was what was supporting Jesus. The Sanhedrin also didn't want to attract the attention of the Roman authorities. So they sent these religious experts in the law to Jesus to debate with him. And so far, they haven't been successful because Jesus' responses are even better than their questions. He had better answers. Now, today is the last of these debates, and it's not really a debate. It's as though this expert in the law had been sitting among the crowd listening to these debates, kind of like a sporting event, I guess. And he was impressed with how Jesus answered and his knowledge of the law. So he comes up with his own question. Now, Jesus has been asked this question before. It's kind of a compliment that he would ask Jesus this question because he's treating him as though he himself were an expert in the law instead of just an ignorant Galilean preacher. He's treating him as if he's trained. And so he asks him this question. And now we're ready to read the story. Mark 12, 28 to 34. Now I'm reading from the New International Reader's Version because it's easy to read. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. 
And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. <laughs> I love that sentence. <laughs> you know, in Luke 10, 25 to 37, on another occasion, another expert asked Jesus a very similar question, and Jesus answered with the parable of the Good Samaritan, which will be important later in this lesson. So let's look at Mark's story of this occasion. The answer that Jesus gave should have been obvious because the Shema is a summary of the Ten Commandments. The law required that the Shema be recited every morning and evening. I think that even today devout Jews continue to recite the Shema, morning and evening. I have a Jewish neighbor. I should ask him if he does so, if it's still done today. Maybe I'll do it when I see him next. There's also an admonition where Moses tells the people, the commandments I give you today must be in your hearts, which of course means they need to memorize them, right? Make sure your children learn them. Talk about them when you're at home. Talk about them when you walk along the road. Speak about them when you go to bed. And speak about them when you get up. Write them down and tie them on your hands as a reminder. And tie them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and write them on your gates. I suppose that today we would say, put them on your t-shirts. Put frame posters on the wall. Put them on your caps. And the doors of your house have a plaque there so when people come, they can see it. The point is to remember them. It's that important. God was saying, do not forget these commandments. So again, what was that commandment that Jesus reminded the experts in the law as the most important commandment? It was, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one and the only real God there is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So, you could say that if the God you worship isn't a God of love, that you can worship with your whole being like that, then you're really not worshiping the real God. And so, if the way you read the Bible is not through that lens of the love of God, of and for God, then you're reading it wrongly, and you could be getting into some serious trouble with it. Then, even though the expert in the law had not asked for the second commandment, Jesus gives it to him anyway, saying that it's like the first one. The second commandment summarized the second half of the Ten Commandments. So Jesus added, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Those two are the lens through which we should read the entire Bible. Why? Because you need the lens to understand this blurry, confusing book correctly. So, let's put on that lens to think about what we know of the Old Testament. Uh, which brings me to a confession I have to make. I haven't been able to read the Old Testament history books and some of the Psalms for some time now because they are so violent. They would imply a different kind of God that God is not a God of love at all. I mean, it says that God killed the sons of Levi because they offered unauthorized fire. And he had the earth swallow up whole families of apostates in Israel. Does that sound like a God of love to you? Now, as I read the books of the Old Testament, I see God forging a warrior nation 
that was suffering in Egypt, and he wanted to create this warrior nation that would commit genocide against the Middle Eastern peoples who lived in the land that he promised to give them. <sighs> they were to kill these men, women, children, and all the animals, and to revel in their victory over them. They did it in order to create a space for the nation to live. Yes, I know we're talking about things that happened hundreds of centuries ago, and it's the way people were. Everybody had to create a space for themselves. And so that's how they did it creating a space for them and their way of life. And people are still doing it that way today, aren't they? But is it God's intention, let alone God's command, that it be done like that? Is war a God of love? So I have had great difficulty understanding the history books of the Old Testament and some of those psalms. So then, while preparing for this Bible study, I decided to read the Old Testament again. This time, I'm looking for clues into the character of God and how his character reflects his expectations for people's behavior. As Paul wrote to his student in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, God has breathed life into all scripture. It's useful for teaching us what is true. It is useful for correcting our mistakes. It's useful for making our lives whole again. It is useful for training us to do what is right. By using scripture, a person of God can be completely prepared to do every good thing. So, I wondered how those violent history books could do what Paul just said. Then I remembered that Jesus always taught in parables, and the Bible claims to be the word of God, and Jesus claims to be God. So the Bible must be, in some way, a parable, a vast parable. So, looking through the lens of the love of God, then, I see that God had his writers assemble this vast parable from all the stories that had been circulating for centuries among the people. And this parable depicts God's struggle to redeem his creation. For example, I saw how God created everything good. He created humans, good, but humans then decided to go evil. So God chose one particular people as his very own, but let the others continue to go their own violent ways. God saw that the entire population of the earth was all evil all the time. He said they filled the earth with chaos and violence. And it grieved him. And that tells you something right there about God. He regretted making humans because of all this violence and chaos. So I saw that the Bible itself is a series of selected stories of the people group that God had selected for himself. It starts really with the story of Noah and his family who, quote, walked with God. And that means they loved God and did what was right. And so even though God had decided to drown all flesh with breath in it that he had created, he would preserve Noah and his family and all the animals in a large boat. God would redeem his creation through them because he loved them. I also remember that these waters and seas 
are an ancient Hebrew symbol for violence and chaos. So God, you could say then that God saved Noah and his family and all the animals that were in the boat with him from the violence and chaos that had taken over the earth. And through them, God will redeem his creation. This time, he made promises to Noah that he called the covenants. One was, and it was the first one, was that he would not destroy the earth, but it would continue as it always had. The seasons would continue, day and night would continue, and so forth. The second covenant was that he would never destroy humankind with a flood again. And he made a rainbow in the sky to remind humans and through, it says, remind himself that of this covenant. The word covenant then is another extremely important lens of love throughout the Bible. Look for it when you read it. What is a covenant? A covenant is a one-sided act of love that's all God's doing and does not depend on anything that humans can do to earn it. The Hebrew saying is, the steadfast love of the Lord is forever. Then God also made covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the patri they were the patriarchs of his chosen nation, and he said through them that he would bless the entire human race, and in fact, all of creation. He would redeem the nations. <sighs> okay, I admit I do see the love of God there. And the Old Testament really does look now like a parable to me, as well as a historical document. I mean, a historical document can also be a parallel, a parable, right? It's a parable demonstrating the love of God in these covenants to Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that continue even to this day and that God will bless everyone through it by the end. But what about this formation of this warrior nation, Israel, under the leadership of warrior leaders, Moses and Joshua? Where do we see the loving character of God in his orders to them, as recorded in these historical books? Again, I think it's a parable regarding the people of God's own choosing. Seeing it through then the lens of the love of God in Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 9, Moses explains to the children of Israel, you are a holy nation. The Lord your God has set you apart for himself. He has chosen you to be his special treasure. He chose you out of all the nations on the face of the earth to be his people. The Lord chose you because he loved you very much. He didn't choose you because you had more people than other nations. In fact, you had the smallest number of all. The Lord chose you because he loved you. He wanted to keep the covenant he had made on oath with your people long ago. That's why he brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and he brought you back from the land where you were slaves. He set you free from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So I want you to realize that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God. He keeps his covenant for all time to come. He keeps it with those who love him and obey his commands. He shows them his love. So God wants his people to love him in return. It only makes sense, doesn't it? And because he loves them, he wants them to love each other as well. And so he commands them to love your neighbor as yourself. At first, Israel thought that this commandment was exclusive to themselves. And so they killed everybody else around them. I guess they thought God must not love those other people. 
But then, as the story of the Good Samaritan puts it, Jesus explains that God loves everyone, even the despised Samaritans. So, what about those psalms that are so violent? The psalmist says he hates these people so much he wants to throw their infants against a wall. And I suspect David might have actually done something like that. But how does that equate with a loving God? Here's what I think. I think God is being very honest about humans. The Psalms express honest human feelings that God has right, has his poets write exactly as they are. They're a demonstration, really, of the violence that had covered the earth before the time of Noah and continues in the hearts of humanity. The human tendency for violence has not gone away. We can see that clearly enough, right? If it continues, it will destroy us completely. So, when you read about those terrible psalms, remember the terrible things that had happened to those people. The psalmists were express expressing their grief as revenge. It's a natural human reaction that God reports. Through the Psalms, God is unflinching in his portrayal of human feelings. It was the psalmist laments their anguish that we read. It is not meant to depict the character of God. Those Psalms are God's honest portrayal of human feelings. The rage we feel over injustice to ourselves. Perhaps you have had injustice in your life and you also feel rage. Well, these psalms are for you and it might be helpful for you to read them. But in Leviticus 19.18, God corrects these natural feelings saying, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And the New Testament over and over and over tells the churches to stop having malice and rage towards one another, but to love one another. It, it was a continual problem and still is today. The revenge psalms then are not meant to demonstrate the love of God, but other psalms do demonstrate the love of God and are meant to help us worship and trust in his covenants of love. So in John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus tells his followers to emulate the nature of God. He says, I give you a new command, love one another. You must love one another as I have loved you. If you love one another, everyone will know you are my disciples. Anything else is not of God. For as John says in his first letter, God is love. Check yourself. Jesus said that the experts in the law searched the scriptures to see if they could find how to earn eternal life. And Jesus says they missed the most important thing that the scriptures point to Jesus, who then reminded them of what they had been reciting every day, the greatest commandments. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So let's use this lens that God has given us. We see that even in the vicious history books and Psalms, there is love hidden like bright stars and kindness in the blackest of night. 
look for the stars, such as we see in the book of Ruth, for example. Now, let's remember to read the Bible through this lens of God's steadfast love for people. There really, there really is no other careful way to understand it. God is love. So you really can love God because that's the way he is. And you really can love your annoying neighbor next door. Amen.